Hatchet by Gary Paulson Chapter 3 Going to die, Brian thought. Going to die, going to die, going to die. His whole brain screamed it in the sudden silence. Going to die. He wiped his mouth with the back of his arm and held the nose down. The plane went into a glide, a very fast glide that ate altitude, and suddenly there weren't any lakes. All he'd seen since they started flying over the forest was lakes, and now they were gone. Gone. Out in front, far away at the horizon, he could see lots of them. Off to the right and left, more of them, glittering blue in the late afternoon sun. But he needed one right in front. He desperately needed a lake right in front of the plane, and all he saw through the windshield were trees. Green, death, trees. If he had to turn, if he had to turn, he didn't think... He could keep the plane flying. His stomach tightened into a series of rolling knots and his breath came in short bursts. There! Not quite in front, but slightly to the right, he saw a lake. l shape with rounded corners. And the plane was nearly aimed at the long part of the L, coming from the bottom and heading to the top. Just a tiny bit to the right. He pushed the right rudder pedal gently and the nose moved over. But the turn cost him speed and now the lake was above the nose. He pulled back on the wheel slightly, and the nose came up. This caused the plane to slow dramatically, and almost seemed to stop and wallow in the air. The controls became very loose-feeling, and frightened Brian, making him push the wheel back in. This increased the speed a bit, but filled the windshield once more with nothing but trees, and put the lake well above the nose and out of reach. For a space of three or four seconds, things seemed to hang, almost to stop. The plane was flying, but so slowly, so slowly, it would never reach the lake. Brian looked out to the side and saw a small pond, and at the edge of the pond, some large animal. He thought a moose, standing out in the water, and so still looking, so stopped, the pond and the moose and the trees, as he slid over them now only three or four hundred feet off the ground, all like a picture. Then everything happened at once. Trees suddenly took on detail, filled his whole field of vision with green, and he knew he would hit and die, would die. But his luck held, and just as he was to hit, he came into an open lane, a channel of fallen trees, a wide place leading to the lake. The plane, committed now to landing, to crashing, fell into the wide place like a stone, and Brian eased back on the wheel and braced himself for the crash. But there was a tiny bit of speed left, and when he pulled on the wheel, the nose came up, and he saw in front of the blue of the lake, and at that instant, the plane hit the trees. There was a great wrenching as the wings caught the pines at the side of the clearing and broke back, ripping back just outside the main braces. Dust and dirt blew off the floor into his face so hard he thought there must have been some kind of explosion. He was momentarily blinded and slammed forward in the seat, smashing his head on the wheel. Then a wild crashing sound ripping of metal, and the plane rolled to the right and blew through the trees, out over the water and down, down to slam into the lake. Skip once on water as hard as concrete, water that tore the windshield out and shattered the side windows, water that drove him back into the seat. Somebody was screaming, screaming as the plane drove down into the water. Someone screamed tight animal screams of fear and pain, and he did not know that it was his sound that he roared against the water that took him and the plane still deeper, down in the water. He saw nothing but since blue, cold blue-green, and he raked at the seatbelt catch, tore his nails loose on one hand. He ripped at it until it released, and somehow, the water trying to kill him, to end him, somehow he pulled himself out of the shattered front window and clawed up into the blue, felt something hold him back, felt his windbreaker tear, and he was free tearing free, ripping free, but so far, so far to the surface, and his lungs could not do this thing, could not hold, and were through, and he sucked water, took a great pull of water that would finally win, finally take him, and his head broke into light, and he vomited and swam, pulling without knowing what he was, what he was doing, without knowing anything, pulling until his hands caught at weeds and muck, pulling and screaming until his hands caught at last in grass and brush, and he felt his chest on land, felt his face in the coarse blades of grass, and he stopped. 
Everything stopped. A collar came that he had never seen before, a collar that exploded in his mind with the pain, and he was gone, gone from it all, spiraling out into the world, spiraling out into nothing. Nothing.